Okay. Yeah, no, what we do is we take a bunch of data and we put it in a cauldron, sacrifice a chicken and predict the future. <laughs> this is it's a silly, silly industry, but it does have, like there are good functional drivers and good things that we can get out of. Welcome. I'm your host, Mark Graziano, and this is the GRC Podcast. This is your source for discussions about governance, risk, compliance, and more. I partner with incredible security champions to challenge the GRC industry stereotype and to outline security career and program strategies that you can implement today. Welcome to episode five of the GRC podcast. In my humble opinion, I believe that enterprise risk has become a complete mess of over-engineering and unreasonable expectations that we can somehow drive risk down to zero. So today we're stripping it all back to its foundational core with Temporal Cloud's manager of trust and compliance, Daniel Redding. Risk isn't meant to predict the future. It's meant to ensure that we're not doing anything that's wildly irresponsible. But if we should choose to do something wildly irresponsible, at least we're aware mentally of the worst case scenario. The existence of chance and variables 100% outside of our control will ensure that risk is always an art rather than a science. Daniel's foundational method breaks risk measurement down into three pivotal questions that can be universally understood by everyone. One, what matters most to you? Two, out of those, which one tops the list? And three, where does everything else rank in comparison? In this episode, keep in mind that Daniel is visually walking us through a spreadsheet, which is going to be available in the show notes, that he uses to demonstrate this approach. Let's get into it. Welcome to the show. I'm really happy to have you on. Thank you. Do I need to give you a... uh... A little bit cheers. of a, a camera cheers there. Yeah, cheers. Long, long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> oh, very, very much honored. Thank you. Yeah, th- thank you for having me on. I'm excited to be here and talk about, uh, you know, risk. Yep, and risk is one of those things that I think it took you describing the way that you do risk to actually make me feel like I gave a crap about risk. It was one of those things where it's become so like academic and so almost people trying to be Nostradamus, collecting all the information to make a decision that just almost becomes counterproductive. And I think at a certain point with risk, there's got to be some type of like optimal stopping. Like you, at a certain point, you can't predict the future and you just got to be okay with it. But at the same time, we want to do our diligence. And I think you've managed to find the, the happy medium when it comes to risk and risk tracking and data aggregation, all that fun stuff. So I want to make sure I gave you an opportunity to share some of your quick wins. If you don't understand risk, if you're uh, just standing up your program, or even if you're trying to mature it, I think you got a lot of insights to share. So just starting out, I think, especially when it comes to talking about risk internally at companies, taxonomy is one of those things that gets in the way of a lot of people, people misrepresenting risk as a vulnerability or a threat or all that other fun stuff. So I think at the very uh, least, let's start off talking about the concept of risk and what are some of the main terms and how would you describe risk to somebody who doesn't quite know what it is? Yeah, absolutely. So risk is, I mean, it's a phenomenally simple practice. It is how, how bad is something when it happens and how likely is it to happen? So from kind of a real world perspective, I walk around my house and I stub my toes a lot because I am a clumsy asshole. Uh, the forward looking view of how often I'm going to stub my toes. That's my likelihood. That's how likely it is to happen or my frequency, how frequent this will happen. Um, and how much it's going to hurt is the impact, right? What kind of damage that's going to do to me or to my stuff, or, you know, I have hardwood furniture. It's a mess. Um, but you take those two things together, how likely is it to happen? How bad will it be when it does? And that is effectively our risk. Now we can get into amplifying factors. Um, things that either help a risk be realized happen more often, more frequently, or hurt more when it happens, like a red wine, right? When I walk around my house with a glass of red wine, I've created an amplifying factor. For likelihood, I'm paying less attention, thereby more likely to crush my poor little pinky toe uh, against a coffee table. For impact, um, I have chairs with white upholstery. So instead of me unleashing a string of obscenities and sitting down while holding back tears, you know, there's an off chance my wife stabs me or we need to get professional cleaning for these chairs, right? And those are two completely new impact dimensions that I've then added to this. So I have a decent understanding of like what this risk is. I have an impact, I have a likelihood, right? I have my, my amplifying factor of wandering around my house uh, with my red wine. Now I have to look at, is this risk, do I, Daniel, find this risk to be acceptable. Is this okay? Right? That this is what's happening. And in my opinion, 
yeah, otherwise I would do something about it. But there are several different responses that we can take to this risk. Let's say it's not acceptable. You know, I may want to transfer some of that risk, transfer some of that impact. In, in business and actually in a, lot of, in a lot of just real world, insurance is risk transference. I am transferring the risk of needing surgery on that toe that I accidentally ground into dust. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but I'm no, transferring that to, to Kaiser or whoever, right? Um, I could avoid this risk, which I guess I didn't think this far ahead before I started down this very foot-based example, but I could give up walking, right? And there are other mitigations that we can kind of, that, that'll come back to you because that's like a good next step, right? Um, but risk acceptance, right? I, if I decide, okay, this risk is acceptable. Um, it is acceptable based on all this context around this risk, based on the amplifying factors, based on the existing mitigating factors, based on my personal risk tolerance, what I am willing to accept in my life, right? Now, that can change over time. So if I decide this risk is acceptable today, it might not be tomorrow. So I do need to consistently reassess what this risk is. If I uh, lose my job and I lose health insurance, well, I've you know, added a pretty significant potential financial impact to this risk. And it may not be acceptable. Instead of doing a lot of swearing, I might need to spend a lot of money to get a problem fixed, right? And so losing that ability to transfer some of the risk may make it not acceptable. And I may decide I need mitigating factors or I need to find a new way to transfer or I need to, you know, give up walking. Terrible example. Um, but... Then we get into mitigating factors and risk mitigation as a whole, right? Um, for this, I'm really going to focus on mitigating controls because they're the easiest things to wrap our, our hands around here. But let's say I, I start consistently wearing slippers around the house. I have slippers. I have several pairs of slippers. I just rarely wear them. Now, that's not going to stop me from stubbing my toes. It's not going to make it less frequent. It's not going to happen less because I'm doing this. But I now have a layer of floof that helps keep my toes both attached and functional, right? That's gonna reduce that impact. Or maybe I start keeping some more lights on and clean up the baby toys that are all over the place all of the time to create both a higher visibility and less chaotic walking environment. I then may be less likely to stub my toes. I may reduce that frequency, right? And so that's what we want from our controls is we wanna make things hurt less and or happen less often. And then I guess in this case, I am the person who would be accepting risk, managing these controls. And so I would track, okay, how effective is this? Am I wearing slippers all the time? Uh, how many times have I cried while wearing slippers versus when I wasn't to be able to see how much I've reduced that impact? Uh, now, if you take all of that stuff I just said uh, out of my living room and apply it to information security, that's the whole job. Risk. I think that's always like the, uh, like I've been trying to do this even just in my own life of trying to explain like what I do to people who aren't in this particular space. You walk um, bad have too? You taken... <laughs> oh yes. Actually going back to your, uh, your wine <laughs> one, I had a similar thing where it was like, I got laid off from a job. Um, and I was cleaning a wine glass and I, I was just like, like doing that thing where you're like, you're, you're drying out the inside and I ended up snapping the neck and it just like jammed right into my hand. I was like, Oh Lord. Oh, like. The financial implications, like, I got to just, like, suck it up. Like, I can't go. I can't get an ambulance. <laughs> Please stop bleeding. So uh, oh. that one, it really resonates with me. And, and now I fully understand risk because you put it in those terms. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, losing, losing that risk transference is scary. And I've also, I'll, I'll tell you this, you know, sometime maybe off air, I actually had a glass explode in my hand. Um, and I needed a bunch of stitches from it. So again, going back to it, the relatability of a wine-based risk explanation, I think is very helpful. But I think that's one of the main things, especially when it comes to risk, is the communication between the concepts like that. A lot gets lost in translation when you think it shouldn't. So making sure you're very upfront with anybody who's going to be involved in that process. Here are our terms. Here's how we're describing things. Here's how this is all going to play out. And here's how it's all going to play together. I think it's, it's critical to make sure everybody's on the same page at the very beginning of that. Otherwise, you're going to come to the end and Everyone's going to have their own comments and critiques about why it's right, why it's wrong, what needs to be included, what wasn't included. So again, I think having a good analogy is a very critical portion of being able to have your own risk management program. Um, now, in terms of 
I think like quick wins, because one of the things you showed me was a spreadsheet, something that you're recently doing where it's really just kind of refactoring the way that it thinks about risk. And one of the things that you're doing when you do that, you, you break down whatever you had in the past and you try to stand up something new that's uh, uh, better representative of what the business is looking for. Um, would you be willing to show us that? And just for our listeners who might be listening to this only audio, there is going to be a video component to this. Um, hopefully, if Daniel's willing to show us what he's been working on. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I probably can't show actual Twilio stuff. I'll just make something new on the spot. Oh, come on. Um, I'm as, a professional. I knew you weren't going to show Twilio stuff. Nah. As, a, as, as long as you believe that two guys making a spreadsheet on YouTube is good content. Oh, it's phenomenal content. It's going to be the most monetized. I, and if you give me diagrams of the, uh, the foot explanation, I think that's also going to be some gated I, content. I am, you can find me on WikiFeet at Daniel Redding. <laughs> <laughs> the first explicit uh, <laughs> podcast of the series. So thank you for that, Daniel. You're, you're welcome, I guess. Uh, <laughs> let me pull up a, a just a quick like tiering demonstration workbook here that we can. Can you see this? Everybody see? Yeah, it? I can see that. Can, can everybody at home see this? Yeah, <laughs> sweet. You're on mute, Daniel. <laughs> Perfect. So, so well, you know what we're putting together is really it's really to define the criticality of. A thing. How much should we care about this? And our drivers for that are the context around why we care about something. And going back to likelihood and impact, if we start with impact, there are a lot of factors that make a security incident hurt more. Right? If we have uh, if we have a higher revenue system, and this security incident can cause downtime. You know, maybe we are losing some revenue. Okay, uh, we have multiple products higher revenues, higher impact, right? If we have regulatory compliance requirements. Yep, I can spell. It's fine. <laughs> I was about um, to compliment your typing because I feel like anytime I'm on video or somebody's looking at me, my fingers just are like, I'm going to do whatever. Oh, this is going to be a disaster. I'm sitting here. I've got a glass <laughs> of whiskey. What if? Pax 9. It's a blend from Lux Road Distillery. It's fantastic. I love it. But I'm sitting here with a whiskey typing in a, an Excel document on a podcast. So like, hey... Uh, Work on that sponsorship for us, and then I'll allow it. All right. <laughs> Lux Row, call me. Uh, like, if we have regulatory compliance, if it is something that is uh, SOX relevant, there can be very, very significant impacts for not being compliant with SOX requirements or HIPAA requirements, right? We get, we get fined, all that non nonsense. You know, what kinds of data are stored in? You know, do we have various different data types. Maybe we don't have customer data in some specific product. Maybe we don't have very much data or we have very short lived data in a product. So we want to look at data quantity. You know, if you have a billion customer records in one thing and 400,000 at any given time in another thing, you know, just that sheer number of records is going to drive your impact up. So if we look at, you know, things like those and you can look at you know, strategic priority. Revenue is kind of a, a past looking, but if you have a, if you have different strategic priorities, let's say strategic priority, you know, um, and by that, I mean something that's in a closed beta right now or internal only, it hasn't been announced. That's going to be less impactful to your company if you just lose the thing than if it's a flagship product or if it's something you're betting your future on. You know, there was a time AWS wasn't public. It was an internal tool, an internal infrastructure for Amazon. And then there was a time that it was a strategic sales priority. It was a strategic growth driver for Amazon, right? So it became more important for them as they began expanding its use. And then there was a time, you know, now where it's a very successful flagship offering for Amazon, right? They've actually, you know, they've actually fulfilled that strategic priority, those strategic goals with it. And it is a flagship product. Um, now, as your inventory gets more granular, we're going to keep it kind of high level here, but as your inventory gets more granular, you can pull really specific metrics. Um, things like RTO or, you know, the data quantity that's within a specific uh, service or, you know, location or touched by a specific service within a system so that you can even say within that system, these are our, key, these are our hotspots. These are the things we need to focus on. Right. Um, and at some point, you can also begin profiling these based on like confidentiality, integrity, availability, 
so that when you have a vulnerability that's relevant to availability, you have a pretty immediate understanding of how important that vulnerability is, right? Um, so if we look at that, we're just going to stick with these. I'm, I'm not going to do five. Five seems crazy. I'm going to do these three. Revenue, data type. Keep it simple. Strategic priority. <laughs> yeah. We're going we're gonna to be nice and simple here, right? We've got product one, product two, product three. So we have revenue. Um, you know, say our revenue for product one is 100 units of money, right? The um, classic unit of money. Yeah, a classic <laughs> unit of money, a standard unit of money. Um, you know, and say product two is you know, 400 and product three is a thousand. Now, one of the things that I like to do is we want to weight these differently, but that also means we need to kind of normalize on what these things mean, right? And so our, we may have a most sensitive data type, most sensitive. It's only in product one, pretty sensitive it's in product two and product three, right? So our most sensitive we're, we're going to want to align with 100% of our top revenue number, right? Because we want to be able to weight these separately in the future. So we want to have kind of standard numbers. So that if I say, you know, if I say my top one is 500, then it already has half the weighting, right? So keep that at 1,000 and then base these on a percentage of most sensitive. Pretty sensitive. I'm going to say it's, you know, 65% is important. So 650 is just our base score for those. Your strategic priority. Um, this is generally available. It's, you know, it's there. Uh, it's not something we're pushing hard, but it exists. It's driving revenue, right? Um, product two is a strategic priority. It's a strategic goal. It's a driver. Let's call it something other than the Call it strategic driver. That's fine. Call it something other than the title Sounds of the thing. Good. Yeah. Um, product three, I mean, it, it's got the most revenue there. It, just based on that, I'm thinking it's probably flagship. So we'll call it flagship. Flagship again, it's going to be a thousand. Strategic driver, maybe that's, maybe we want to say that's about 80% of a flagship, right? And generally available is about half of it. And also, so, can you describe your, um, I guess you're rating for, for flagship because I think you kind of had a good explanation of like just why you would want that to be considered high for most companies. And I think that's something that a lot of people can use is like if you're betting oh. your brand on this. Yeah, absolutely. That's, I mean, that's the thing that keeps the lights on. That's the thing you're known for. At Twilio, programmable SMS is the thing Twilio is known for, right? They have a lot of other capabilities, but that's the thing they're known for. It's their flagship capability. Um, so that's... That's the thing that keeps the lights on. You know, our strategic drivers, our goals, those are the things that we're building toward in the future. Those are, those are what we want to be our new flagship capabilities. Um, but yeah, they're, hey, if it's keeping the lights on, it's going to be the most important, right? Yeah. Um, so then we're going to look at, hey, how do, we, how do we weight each of these? Let's just say we have three of them. Um, weight one, weight two, weight three. Just call it tens across the board, right? For now. Keep it very simple. But you know, you can you can make these whatever you want. Maybe you think your data types are twice as important as the as the other two factors. Make those twenties. Right? You just want to make sure they're all the same. And just for the listeners too, is this like this is another level of like adding that weight? Because we added the weight in terms of um, like most sensitive, pretty sensitive, general availability, strategic driver, but yeah. this is just another level of factoring. So, so these are these are weighting. So the most sensitive, pretty sensitive. You know, if I if I did a not really sensitive, um, those are weighting within your data type. These are are weightings where you're weighting. Okay, do I care about the amount of revenue I have more than I care about the type of data in this thing? Right. If I care about the revenue more than I care about the data type, if I think that's what's going to hurt me more based on the context of my company and this product and capability, um, then I'm going to increase the weighting for revenue versus data type. Uh, this is, um, it, it's, 
it gives us a number, but it is very much an art, right? What you're going to want to do to find these weightings is you're going to want to talk to your executives and you're going to want to say, hey, these are the things that we're looking at to determine the criticality of any system. These are the factors, the dimensions we're looking at. These factors, which one is most important to you? Which one's the second most important? Which one's the third, the fourth, the fifth most important, right? Um, and then that, that will then get your executives thinking, okay, well, these are the more important things to us, and it'll give you the information to say, like, it'll give them the input and the understanding of the process, and it'll give you the information to properly weight things, which, like, huh. Hey. Now, out of curiosity, because I feel like you've got a, a good way of phrasing certain questions. Like, for example, we were talking about the insider threat one. And instead of coming in with some, like, big insider threat type presentation to get everybody to understand what exactly insider threat is, I think you simply just ask the team, like, hey, if you really wanted to, like, stick it to the company, like, and I said, go wild, like, what would your first steps be? Like, is there a way yeah. that you frame the, uh, the risk in kind of a similar way to get executives to just, like, really understand, just, like, quickly, this is exactly what I'm expecting of you to do to, to really communicate the, uh, the ask? I mean, <laughs> well, yes, not so much in this, but, yeah, with executives, it's, hey, this, this bad thing uh, can happen. We might expect it to. You know, we expect that it's this likely, this is how it can happen. But if you start with, this is the bad thing that can happen, you don't frame it like, hey, a person could get access to this database. I, I have never met a CFO who's going to care about that, right? If you say they're going to they're gonna get access, they're going to exploit this vulnerability, they're going to, you know, perform a CSRF attack against this web application that we have. Oh, Dan, you're already boring me. Okay. <laughs> Right. Uh, if I say, hey, someone can do this and this is how much it's going to hurt. Like this is the impact on our business. This is why the company should care. Right. Um, that is yeah, lead with that. Right. You don't you don't uh, bury the lead. Yeah. Yeah. Don't bury the lead. I was going to say this kind of goes back to our initial conversation of like making sure you're communicating the main point. You're not talking about a very specific vulnerability. You're not talking about the implications of the exploit on that vulnerability. You're talking about the high level risk that this business needs to care about. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. Uh, but with this, like saying, hey, we know that we, our products have revenue. We know that our products have customer data. We know that our products are or aren't, you know, strategic drivers for us. Um, and being able to say, hey, how important is this attribute of this thing to you? Because, yeah, they'll definitely look at revenue and be like, yeah, revenue is important. Protecting our customer data is important. It's, you know, more or less important based on what company and what kind of data it is. You know, um, you know companies that are providing security services and maintaining authentication information or vulnerability information on their customers they're going to look at data types as very, very important versus, you know, potentially versus revenue or strategic priority. Whereas companies that maybe host a lot less data or aren't hosting their customers' data, they're probably going to look at those data types as less important than strategic priority or revenue, right? And those are going to be based on the company, based on the executives. We want this to be usable for us, but also a useful method of communicating with our executives and that, includes, hey, making them feel like they're heard in this process and it's not just crazy opaque math, which is what this is about to turn into, is crazy <laughs> opaque math. Um, yeah. Oh, it is. 100%. So if I'm looking at this and I'm saying, all right, these are, these are the numbers that I've come to. I'm going to look at my revenue times my revenue weight plus because impacts are additive, right? Like having a high amount of revenue and having a high amount of sensitive data, that doesn't, that's not a multiplicative thing, right? So we're adding, we're adding these, and we're adding these. Times, okay, right? Pretty simple, we've got a, we've got a nice big number there. That's, that's fantastic. Um, 
then we're just going to divide these by the way. It's just a nice, uh, it's very, very linear approach. There are some drawbacks to this that I can, nobody wants to know the math behind this, I'm sure. Um, or the drawbacks of the math behind the spreadsheet on the podcast. Um, and then also you did have um, like a document that you had a couple of different ways that executives could weight this. Like when we were kind of stepping through it and you were showing me this initially, okay. um, what was the name of this particular weighting method? Uh, oh, this is, this is just linear weighted. Okay. Um, and this lets us look at, Hey, uh, what number, what number biggest, biggest number. <laughs> just keeping it simple. Yeah. Well, I mean, we don't want this to be complicated. We want yeah. it to be, we're comparing products against each other. Right. We're not comparing them against the other stuff out in the world. We're comparing them against each other. And that way I know I can look at this and I can say, Hey, if I have, um, you know, if I have some kind of vulnerability, something that would never happen, like log for J or whatever. Right. Um, if I have that on all three of these products and I get to fix it on one of them, which one should I choose? Number biggest. Yeah, because that's a good way just to figure out at the very least, we have right. to prioritize something, make it's, it easy for me. Exactly. And it's not going to be perfect. It's not intended to be perfect. It's intended to be just a quick view, comparative model for these. And then if you have different weightings, if you decide, hey, you know what? We really care an enormous amount now about our, um, we really care an enormous amount about our, uh, our revenue these numbers change, right? Or if we just stop caring about our revenue, I don't know if I made these different enough for the numbers to like, oh yeah, now this one, now this one's the highest if we stop caring yeah. about revenue, right? So like, less decimals. No, I need like five decimals to show that I really did the math on this. Yeah. That's the thing is like the math doesn't so much matter. Well, I was going to say, you, you made a statement about this is not perfect. Is there ever a time in which your risk assessment needs to be perfect? Hey, no. That's the answer I was hoping you'd say. Okay. Yeah, no. What we do is we take a bunch of data and we put it in a cauldron, sacrifice a chicken and predict the future. <laughs> this is it's a silly, silly industry. But it does have, like, there are good functional drivers and good things that we can get out of it, right? Based yeah. on our organizational context, we can now say, hey, this one, this one is the one we should fix a problem on. If we, get, if we get one place to fix a problem, we should be looking at that one first because it's the one that, based on our weightings, in conversation with us and our executives, we've decided is the most important. Simple, easy, comparative. You know, it's not... It's, it's not high art. It's just, hey, let's, let's have some comparison here based on the things that make us care, right? And you can do the same thing for likelihood. Um, as you jump into these, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do more, um, I'm not going to do more spreadsheet uh, stuff on this. I'm going to stop sharing. Here we go. Oh, that's totally fine. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give, I'll give you that in case anybody sounds wants good, it. Though. Sounds good. Yeah. If anybody wants to see that, um, feel free. It's going to be on the website. Um, <laughs> Cause yeah, I think the other thing um, that I was thinking about with respect to um, like, I feel you've, you've hit like an optimal stopping point where it's like, you can do like the math, you have some calculations, you can present it to the, uh, the executive board. Um, when it comes to companies that have like fully defined risk teams where it's, it's almost like they're, uh, it's in their best benefit to figure out how to make things as complicated as possible. They've got 40 hours a week that they need to be doing just risk stuff. Do you think, just from like an organizational perspective, how do you think companies should structure their risk teams? Do you think it should be like a cross-functional thing that a GRC resource does some type of risk thing? Or do you think there needs to be a defined risk individual? Or is it dependent on company size? What are your thoughts on that? I think a lot of it's going to be dependent on customer company size and business need. I mean... Um, you know, going into a new company and standing up a risk program, there are a lot of different uses and wants for a risk program. Some companies want issue management. They want you to track, they want you to track the ticket, um, you know, start to finish and that's and track those mitigations. Some companies are like, Hey, we, we want to go hard quant. 
Um, they want to use, you know, Monte Carlo simulations and they want to be figuring out, you know, threat actor capability versus some quantification of your control strength, right? Uh, they want to be doing those kinds of things to derive a, you know, upper and lower and most expected bounds for the likelihood of something occurring and then all of your different impact dimensions. And that's the best way for them to communicate and effectively drive change with their board, with their executives. Like the goal of this isn't to make it complicated, but in some cases, if the best way to communicate with people is to have, yeah, let's do complicated Monte Carlo simulations using, you know, using FAIR and all of these different like rigorous things. We're making sure that all of our assessors have gone to training on how to do estimation and we're pulling all these historical metrics. If that's what's going to drive change, uh, cool. Like, I'm, I'm not gonna say that that's wrong. I'm gonna say that I have not had to do that because that's, uh, in a lot of cases, in my experience, that is a heightened level of complexity that doesn't necessarily have a significant return on investment from a security perspective if you can drive change otherwise, right? If you can drive change without doing it. Because the whole goal is, I know I'm gonna stub my toe. How do I make myself stub my toe less often? How do I make it hurt less when I do, right? And if I need to, if I need to sit here and talk about, you know, um, how, often, how often I have the opportunity to stub my toe, versus how often I take the opportunity to stub my toe, right? Um, if I need to get into that kind of conversation, then I haven't, in my opinion, I haven't expressed that risk in a way already that the executive team cares about. Um, but that's not to say that, you know, look, there, are, there are good quant programs out there. Um, Netflix obviously comes to mind. There's this very uh, very robust. It's very widely known as being a very strong quantitative program. And I was going to make sure I asked you that because I think the quantitative risk is something, especially in our industry, that's thrown around a ton. And it's always just like the fleeting mention of like Monte Carlo, but there's no like, and here's how you apply it in a practical sense. So yeah, so Netflix is one of them. Anything else? Net Netflix is kind of the widely known one that's doing it well. I'm sure there are others that are doing it well. Um, the problem is that it is like to be really effective in it, you have to treat it more like actuarial science, um, more like, you know, insurance. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, they're the only ones that I know that like I could point to. I'm like, I'm sure they've got, they've got all the data because especially too like, and it even becomes like a, a data collection perspective too because like they've got all the data on the people that have like policies. They've got uh, all the data on people who have exercised their policies, the amount that they've exercised, the number of times they've needed to exercise per year. So that was one of those where like, I could see that definitely going into the the quantified because you've got the numbers behind it. But a lot of the stuff that we do in GRC, I feel like there's not the numbers or the the data sets behind it that really warrant going to that particular level or even just the risk based on what you're working with. Yeah. And I mean, we don't want to look when you get popped, you don't want to share all of the information about, hey, this is how much all of these aspects of this cost us. Insurance companies have to pay for it. So they have all the data. We don't have the same kind of data sets that they have. We don't have, even as an industry, we don't have the ability to get those data sets. So even if we, you know, if we decide to fully believe um, something like the uh, cost of a data breach report, it was an annual cost of a data breach report that I personally love reading, but I don't, I mean, it is a, it is survey based, right? Like the data that they're pulling out of there is very survey based. It's very anonymous. It's hard to find a one for one for a given company to really estimate, um, to really estimate effectively. But they have a lot of good information in there about, hey, these are the common threats we saw around things that increase or decrease the cost of a data breach that are around you know, data types. Do you have a CISO? Do you have uh, security orchestration automation in place? Those kinds of things that reduce that cost. So, those, you know, that's when I read it every year. I enjoy it. Um, I apply some aspects of it, but that's probably one of the closest things we have 
to a data set that allows us to quantify um, a lot of losses in information security. And even that, if, if I sit here and say, well, they said that the average record cost this much and that's how I apply it, uh, I, I don't think that's accurate because there are these baseline costs that if you lose one record, that one record is going to cost a ton. But the thousandth record you lost, if that first one was a dollar, the thousandth one you lost, it's, you know, maybe 40 cents. Maybe the one after that's 39 cents, right? Each one, they cost more, but each added one itself costs a little bit less. That's a good call. Yeah, I didn't even think of that. Um, but I think in terms of putting numbers to um, almost feelings or general, like, like one through three or one through five type terms. I think like what you've done with that is it's like, like I said before, it's like it's the perfect kind of mix between the two. Like you've got some type of quantifiable thing that you can put in front of executives where you have a number. Um, it's not like you're going to, as you were taking away the different decimal points, it's not like to the six, like we recognize that that's not reasonable, but at the same time, it's more than just like, you have like the bell curve. We got lows, we got a whole ton of mediums, and then we got a couple of highs. I think it it adds a little bit of credibility and it adds to a little bit of additional prioritization, um, granularity when you actually do get some of those different values in there. So in that sense, I really do appreciate what you've done to like create that differentiation. Like might be two mediums, but like this one is rated a little bit higher than that based on some of those things that we care about as a company. Yeah, like like they're two mediums, but like this medium is on a thing we care about more. Yeah. It's you know, you can get really, you can get really granular with the asset context and you can get into, you know, you can get into likelihood. I honestly, I really like, uh, one of the conversations I had earlier today around indicators we could use for likelihood. You know, I was talking about like opportunity, incentive, difficulty. Um, you know, if you don't actually fix problems, your, your history, um, of having incidents, but, uh, you know, opportunity, like, is it internet facing? incentive, right? If something's providing a security service, if it's protecting something else and that something else is valuable, um, then people are going to have more incentive to attack it. I was having this conversation and uh, this person said, well, why don't we, why don't we talk to Threat Intel and just get information on how much individual accounts are selling for? Like how much does a compromised account cost? Because if it's a higher cost for a compromised account, then obviously people want it more. It's worth more. It's higher ROI to steal. Why don't we leverage that for incentive? And I was like, that's, I never would have thought of that on my own ever. That is smart. Yeah. Because even like if you go into like, like when I was doing PCI, it was like, well, how much does a credit card cost like to purchase? And it's one of those where it's like, if you look at like the values, like, yeah, there's, there's some value to it. Like I can see like stealing an individual one, maybe not, but like stealing a bunch of them. Like that's where you start getting some money. Mm hmm. Yeah. And so like, how, how much does the thing cost? How much is it worth to them? How bad do they want? It? And then like difficulty of, you know, do we have good technology hygiene, good security hygiene? Do we have a custom home rolled authentication solution, right? Like these things that make it easier or harder uh, for someone to compromise it. And kind of similarly, just deriving a comparative likelihood the same way. Yeah. Um, to be able to look at a lot of this prioritization, right? These aren't necessarily like inherent risk or anything like that. They're just, hey, this is how critical this thing is. This is how much we've decided and agreed we care about it. It's the whole prioritization thing I think that I like about that spreadsheet that you have because it's, it's infinitely scalable. Like you can add any number of different weights. You can add any number of different variables that your business cares about. Just keep expanding the number of rows or number of columns and you're good to go. I know. And we're... Honestly, we're so on brand right now. Two GRC people talking about a spreadsheet. <laughs> oh God, I was just doing my episode zero talking about that. Uh, I'm not <laughs> sure. I'm not sure if you came across. It was the Spirit Halloween meme where it was like a GRC professional. Like it includes vague statements, obvious statements, a really, really large spreadsheet. And I was just like, oh my God. Like that was one of the, <laughs> one of the factors that like drove me to create this. It's like, oh my God, like the perception of it's terrible. And here we are. We're recording an episode. You and I make this spreadsheet. But at the right. same time, you can translate the spreadsheet into something more meaningful. If you have other tools, you can even implement this within a tool. Um, so there's there's other ways to take this. So I wouldn't view this episode and be like, ah, my suspicions, they're confirmed. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> no, and I I mean, I don't know. I don't know how much I'm allowed to soapbox on your uh, on your go podcast for it. Here. I'll okay, allow it. Sweet. Yeah. Awesome. 
Um, I actually think that that perception is in a lot of cases really accurate. It's uh, warranted. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a reason why like stereotypes exist. It's like, we've done something to deserve this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have, and I think, uh, I think there are a lot of people in GRC who aren't producing value in a modern way right now. All right. So we've just gone over, obviously that spreadsheet is great. It's a great foundation for kind of what teams can use to build their own risk programs. Um, what is, what's risk look like, like in terms of the next steps for you, either personally in the work that you're currently doing, or where do you think the industry needs to go with it? I mean, I think that, I think the industry needs to, uh, simplify and focus and risk and understand where it sits within the GRC ecosystem. Um, you have your controls that exist to drive down risk. Everything we do in security, we do to reduce our risk, right? We don't patch vulnerabilities for fun. We patch them because they represent a security risk, right? Um, and what risk as a function needs to do is scale better and be less focused on spreadsheets and more focused on contextual enablement of decision making, right? Gathering this kind of context to be able to say, this is an input, not a replacement for actual decision making, but an input to decision making that gives us a layer of defensibility when we push for a thing to help us build and strengthen our influence, to help our stakeholders understand uh, what these problems are. Like building out that contextual awareness when there are problems uh, within your GRC ecosystem, within your, uh, within your security posture to help with that prioritization. I think that's where, I think that's where risk needs to go um, GRC as a whole, I think needs to get, uh, significantly more technical, right? We have tools like, um, we have tools like Drata and Vanta and, you know, uh, Mondu and these you know, policy as code tools where we can implement, this is the requirement that's aligned with compliance. This is the technical way with that we need it. We can continuously assess and evidence this. We can continuously audit against it. Um, and we have those kinds of tools that, you know, in a lot of cases, they are coming to replace people who are only good at spreadsheets. So, like, I guess get better. <laughs> if, if you're a GRC person, you can't do some, some simple Python scripting to hit an API and pull a control status. Get, like, yeah, and get I think on that's... YouTube learn the thing because these tools will make those people obsolete if they can't do even that bit. Yeah. Um, and I would say if you're not willing to go down the technical route, at the very least understand how your suggestions are going to be implemented within the organization. Cause there's a lot of like cultural stuff that's not taken into account when you have a framework says we need to do X, Y, and Z. And to accommodate that we need to do this. And then if you think about what you told the business to do, it's like, how are the users going to interact with that? Does that allow the business to have like the appropriate administrative functions, like training for one thing? Like if uh, for some reason you need to escalate, like how quickly do you escalate? Who do you need to escalate to? If you've somehow like you're rolling out a program and you've delayed the escalations, do you send them all at once? Does that really remediate a risk or does that just cause like animosity amongst the users internally or annoy the management where it's like, I got notified, I got notified and I got notified. And then you have three levels of management who are just like, what am I supposed to do with this? So yeah, keeping <laughs> at the very least, keep in context, the suggestions that you're making, how it impacts the business and how it like impacts the uh, user experience, I'd say. Oh yeah. And also this is a, this is a pet peeve of mine. If you write a risk statement and you can't even tell me what the recommendation based on that risk statement is, it's not a risk statement. It's stupid. If, if I write a risk statement and it's like, well, we are going to have a bad thing happen because the security culture bad. What the fuck are you asking us to do? What do you want? What do you want from me? Yeah, right? No. Like, be able to make a specific, actionable recommendation anytime you write a risk statement. If you can't make a specific, actionable recommendation, don't include that risk statement because if you can't make the recommendation, your CEO, your CFO, your board, they're not going to be able to take that anything for action. They're going to look at it and go, neat. So you're saying a GRC analyst includes very obvious statements is, uh, is not the way to go about it? Oh, yeah. yeah. 
Well, I mean, they can be obvious, but fair enough, fair enough. They, they can be obvious, but they better be able to be fixable. <laughs> obvious and actionable. And yeah, yeah. I mean, ask, just, you know, just ask, get on Google, get on, you know, whatever, and like, look up, how do I, how do I fix this problem? Like, what recommendation should I make here? What's a mitigation for this? Like, do the bare minimum. Because if you're like, what's the fix for security culture bad? Mm -hmm. So basically the recommendation I'm hearing is if you're going to own risk, own it from start to finish as opposed to I've, de I've identified a problem, like who's going to fix this? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like if a, a lot of risk is pointing at fires. Hey, there's a fire over there. There's a fire over there. There's a fire over there. That one's the hottest. Right. Cool. At some point you do need someone with a bucket to help solve this problem. Otherwise, mm, right? So, you know, be able to make a recommendation. Throw water on that. And that, and that. But that one first. But throw water on that one first, because <laughs> that, one's, that one has the highest number. I think that's a, that's a very <laughs> fair critique. So now, Obviously, we had that spreadsheet that you got going on. Is there anything else you're working on either as it relates to risk or anything else in the broader GRC space that you want to share? I mean, um, I'm working on and maybe we'll maybe we'll do a follow up episode in like 100 episodes when you're famous or whatever. Um, <laughs> I'm yeah, the most famous GRC person. Oh, yes. Yeah, so sad exactly title. I'm a niche <laughs> Internet security uh, celebrity here. Uh, no, I'm, I'm working on. Um, yeah, kind of just on my off time, building a framework for uh, building a framework for how to build continuous monitoring and compliance, and what that what that needs to look like to be repeatable, as opposed to you know, at a company I can say okay, well this is how we're going to do it, but how to make building continuous monitoring repeatable uh, industry wide, regardless of company. I think that is a much more interesting problem. Um, and, you know, some of the tools are trying to solve that through dictating your control implementations, which works in a subset of cases and doesn't in others. But I think being able to say, okay, well, this is how you think about it. This, is, this should be how you think about continuously monitoring your control, how you think about, hey, this is the control. To that control, we're going to need to figure out our system of record for that control. We're going to need to figure out how we pull information from that system of record for that control. We're going to need to think about how we create that evidence that that control is in place. And if it's not in place, how are we alerting on the fact that it's not in place? Right? So we're going to need to think about all of those things. And I'm, I'm just working, doing my initial thoughts on what that framework should look like um, and how to make that easy and repeatable. And I'm planning to put it in a spreadsheet. I mean, like, whatever gets you to that stage one. And I think I've seen uh, seen aspects of that, especially when you're talking about how do we how do we monitor this particular policy? Because I think that's one of my my main things that I'm harping on right now, especially now that policy is under me. Is like, look, just because you wrote it down in a text document doesn't mean you understand how your business works. How does this control translate to some technical thing that you can repeatably test? And you showed me a spreadsheet. And again, <laughs> we're not going to dog on spreadsheets on this show. There is a time and a place for them as long as they're good. But yeah, where you tied controls and policies together and then you tied it to some type of how do we test this so i think yeah. that needs to be done in the organization there is a way to get that repeatable like we all have policies we all have controls we all have technologies that have some type of way to implement the controls that we're trying to satisfy so i think there is definitely a time and a place for that um anything else on uh maybe potentially the the career front that you'd like to share with us oh no <laughs> come on <laughs> No, um, I did. I did uh, recently accept a position. I'll be moving to uh, temporal. If anybody, you know, if anybody needs long-lived, reliable workflows, hit up temporal. I guess I don't know any of the salespeople yet. I mean, they're gonna be hitting up you. You are. Uh, what was your title? I am gonna be the trust and compliance manager. I don't know, something like that. Trust and compliance. I'm gonna be, gonna be on the calls. If you guys need anything as it relates to temporal cloud, you're gonna be hitting up Daniel. So get uh, get get excited to see his face more. If you're gonna need uh, any kind of uh, workflow automations and durability, 
Yeah, I'm going to be the, uh, the the initial GRC hire there. Very cool. Well, congratulations on, on that new role, man. I'm really excited out. for you. Yeah, I'm I'm excited. It's a uh, I don't know. I live in a basement. I have open framing. <laughs> like, <laughs> I feel like this is a good move. You're really living out the uh, the dungeons part of the Dungeons and Dragons. I know that's also part of your your personal persona there. Oh yeah, I got all my dice right here. <laughs> All right. Um, anything else that you would like to discuss, either something that I missed as it relates to risk specifically or anything else, again, that's happening in your life that you'd like to make sure any listeners are aware of? And also, how can we get in contact with you if we have any kind of questions related to risk or GRC in general? I mean, yeah, people can feel free to hit me up on, um, on LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn.com slash in slash. Don't even worry about the URL. I'll, I'll take care of it. It's going to be on the show notes, people. Don't worry. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hit me up on LinkedIn. I might respond. Definitely don't be like, hey, I have this, uh, you know, contract to hire opportunity in Plano, Texas for $49 an hour <laughs> is on site required. Uh, don't hit me up with that because I do not care. I'm not going to respond. Uh, but otherwise, yeah. Uh, LinkedIn. Let me know. Totally fair. All right, Daniel, again, thank you for always finding the optimal stopping at all of the things that you do. I think you have a, a good, keen understanding of what level of effort results in the appropriate level of ROI and keeping that ratio in mind and for putting things in perspectives that people can understand. So always appreciate having you on. Absolutely. I ran out of whiskey. We'll have to do more next time. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Talk to you later. Thanks for joining us for another episode of the GRC podcast. We're releasing new episodes on the second and fourth Monday of every month. So be sure to mark your calendar. You can listen to us on Spotify, Apple, Google, or wherever you love to listen to your favorite podcasts. If you're enjoying the show, please take a moment to rate and leave a review. It really helps us reach more listeners like you. Don't forget to connect with us on our social media. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram under the handle at the GRC podcast or on LinkedIn by searching for the GRC podcast company page. This is a community first podcast, so we'd love to hear your thoughts, your feedback, and suggestions for future episodes. Lastly, please make sure to visit our website, thegrcpodcast.com, where you can find show notes, behind the scenes, and exclusive content. Thanks for listening. Until next time.